I only have one rule. Everyone fights, no one quits. Welcome to WTC Squadcast, a podcast focusing on international metas, tournaments, communities, and the World Team Championship. The WTC is a proud partner of the T-Sports Network, Best Coast Pairings, and is sponsored by The Army Painter. If you'd like to support the podcast and the WTC, please visit our Patreon at www.patreon.com slash WTC Squadcast. Now, let's get on with the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the WTC Squadcast. This is Scott. In this podcast, we get a deeper insight into how the teams work, how do they form their teams, and precisely what do they expect from the event. I'm Mashiv, and today we have the Canadian captain, Christopher Hayes. Thanks, Chris, for coming on to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's uh, exciting. I've been listening to these, and it's good to finally be on one. Uh, well, hopefully we'll I'll be able to do everybody, uh, but uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. Can you introduce yourself uh, to us for to, for anybody who has who doesn't know you? Yeah, so my name is Chris Haynes. I'm the uh, Canadian team captain. Um, I've been doing that role uh, for quite a few ne- years now, since about 2015. Uh, there was one one year that I kind of took off because of the birth of my child, but the rest of the time I've been kind of just running the Canadian team. It's uh, We actually started out in the fantasy squad and then switched to 40K as soon as the, that kind of died. So, and I've been 40K ever since. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the Canadian ha- team hadn't sent its a team to 40K since, until 2016. So that was the first time Canada assembled. Yeah, and sadly, it I, even though like I kind of, we set up the team in 2015 for fantasy and then we switched to 40K, I had to drop out, so Joe Duca yet yeah, actually took the team that year, and then we just continued after that. And it's uh, you know, it's kind of rest is history. Okay, so can you can you okay? So did you start forty k when fantasy stopped? I didn't want to say die because it apparently it died. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> but if you didn't die for that long, it's like Jesus coming back after five years. Yeah, well, I always played 40K, uh, like myself. Uh, I loved 40K. It was my first love. Started in third edition. Uh, I started playing tournaments, like, very, like, in third edition, not a lot. And, and then I think fifth edition is when I really started playing 40K competitively. Uh, at the time, yeah, it was just fantasy was just more popular in my area. Um, so, and, and yeah, you're right. There was no Canadian team. Uh, and actually, I, I would bet that most Canadians didn't even know I guess it was the ETC at the time existed until uh, maybe a couple of years, maybe 2013, I think is the first time somebody tried getting a team together and they were unsuccessful. Uh, you know, because it is a challenge when you have, uh, you know, we are a smaller country, kind of, and it depends on which way you look at it, but we're like on the other side of the ocean and it's, you know, very expensive for people to go across to Europe. So, yeah, that was kind of the initial, it was a challenge and, and then, yeah, when we switched to 40K, even then, we still had trouble getting players, but we were able to kind of work through that. Okay, so, um, sort of, did it, it, did it became easier just because there were more people who wanted to come, or uh, did any other circumstance change since 2016? Or 2013, sorry. Yeah, like, like uh, just in general, yeah, I think the game got bigger over here. Uh, which was really nice to see more competitive. Uh, we had like the Hall of Heroes rankings and stuff like that, and so people actually started playing bigger events. We've always struggled though to get players. Uh, like I think until about 2016, I believe we had eight people fly over, but 2017, 2018, we we didn't have a full Canadian team because we were unable to kind of get the people. But you know, I I think like a lot of you know, we're not maybe the most well-known around the world, but if you go back, like, the Canadian scene was essentially just a really small community, and then it just, over the last couple of years, and with the ITC and kind of the advent of podcasts and YouTube, we've been kind of growing our competitive scene, 
And then just with people hearing the stories of us going to the ETC or WTC, coming home, and you know, kind of getting more and more people involved. Um, I think it was around 2016, we actually started running the first ever Canadian team tournament using your rules, actually, the, the, the ETC rules. And that was kind of the first step in, in growing our team community because before that, nobody's even heard of it or played in that format. So that definitely helped. So I think it was a, a lot of things that really kind of helped us kind of achieve our goal of going there. And it was, you know, all those things I kind of mentioned. Okay, so there are a few things with that that I actually want to know more. You said Canadians uh, community might be considered small in certain extent. How many people are we looking about in terms of active, uh, semi-competitive, competitive 40k players? Yeah, it's hard to speak uh, countrywide because we're so spread out. But if you look at our events, as far as like really hardcore competitive players that will leave even the country, you're looking at a small amount, like 20 to 40, like really competitive players. And then the rest are kind of um, maybe more like local players or, or more for fun. Or maybe they're still competitive, but they don't necessarily travel. Um, we do get, we have about 300, 120 player GTs, maybe four across the country. And that's actually fairly newish, like last five years. We've been able to get numbers up in the 120, 130, 140 range. Um, COVID really hurt us in terms of numbers, but we're hoping to get back up there again. So, yeah, you know, it's not like in the U.S. where they have like, you know, LVO or these big thousand man tournaments. And um, one thing that I don't know if people are familiar with the ITC rankings is it's actually hard for us to get GTs like because there is only three or four in the country or five, you know. Um, and so if you look at the Americans, when they play, they get to go to a GT like every two weeks or every week in terms of players, like 200 plus players. or And so we, we don't generally have those numbers. Even in the UK, they have like a lot, it seems like they have a lot more bigger tournaments than, in, than we do here. In the UK, there seems to be a good amount of what I would consider mid-sized tournaments, which is about 60 to 100-ish. Uh, so, because they are, they are, they have big clubs comparatively to many countries, but they, there aren't that many what what you just mentioned like of your giant tournaments like super gts i think they are called super ma super major sorry with the itc that are 200 plus players but they do have a lot of mid-size gt which makes i think every nearly every weekend before covid so if you are very a competitive player in some countries you have a lot of options to attend so that's not the case in canada then yeah, like we, you know, it's getting better. Like every year, we get more and more and more. But yeah, it's it's like there's a couple. If you want to do like the Canadian rankings, like that's one thing I'm personally struggling with this year is like there's just not enough GTs to get your results into. Um, if you happen to have something on the weekend booked that that one GT is in your area, and when you run GTs, it makes it even harder. Okay. So, okay, one. Uh, you mentioned that the numbers have increased quite dramatically in the last five or six years what how why would you say that happened like what would be your main reasons for it as far as the competitive scene i'm not i, I think a lot of it's just the creation of events right like uh you and i both know like you go to a tournament and it's like addictive it's it's a lot of fun it's some of the most enjoyable time you have with your friends is playing in tournaments you know and so if we're able to when we started running tur big events you know um, like I know I ran and started running a team event in Toronto, which is like our biggest city. And then the guys in Sudbury started running a team event a couple of years later. And then next thing you know, you know, we're running a GT in Ottawa and then the Montreal guys started running a GT. And so it's kind of this big snowball effect, you know, once we got a couple of big events running, uh, with the ITC rankings, I think the ITC rankings helped a lot. And uh, in Canada, a lot of people look to the American scene because uh, for a long time there, before they did this, like even even uh, in Europe, like a lot of countries have joined kind of the ITC rankings. But here, we were always, a, for the most part, a part of the ITC. Just we didn't have our own like Canadian kind of branch to it. We just ranked with the Americans. But so as that kind of the ITC and all that stuff started growing, and then you got a lot of podcasts locally and a lot of... Uh, Kind of personalities in our country we have quite a few of them just all the little communities kind of grow from that so so this 
so essentially the IT feed mainly, but also social media stuff. Yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, and and you know we've always had a, a decent like even way back when with the Games Workshop and all years we always had tournaments. It's just they didn't feel this big and this connected to the rest of the world like they do now. Yeah, now everybody it seems more. I agree with you fully on that. Uh, like everybody feels more connected now. It's sort of maybe sharpens the edges and then old metas across the globe look similar because a good list is just could now can be copied it travels so fast the meta moves quickly but i, I don't want to skip over one thing you when you first answered the question you mentioned the tournament is addictive and i fully agree with that and i can sort of i'll put one over and i team tournaments are just crack like it, they, oh, yeah. are, they are an amazing experience if you when you first enter the hall if you and especially if it's the game day and if you haven't been there in, let's say in the prep you enter the hall hundreds of people are there all for the tournament and it is like even before the, all the preparation with, with your friends that's why the team tournament is in my opinion better than the singles tournament all, even the preparation this is that takes months because of all the travel or the army list or the uh, additional details who will play what what will going to be our tactics and that like and it reaches a catharsis at the tournament and it, it doesn't stop when you leave either it goes on oh for sure and that's the best part about team like so like team events are just amazing because um, you know, they're rarer, so you don't get as burned out running them because you only get to play in, like, really competitive team formats maybe, like, for me, three, four times a year. And, of course, the WTC or ETC was, like, the highlight of my year. And the best part about it is, like, you go there, you play, and then you want to do better, right? And it's not like a singles tournament where you're like, oh, I want to just improve, so I'll buy a new army or I'll upgrade my army and I'll get some practice games in. You need to improve as a team which involves like collaboration with multiple people and getting new people up to speed and you know new armies and practicing and working on your matchups and working on your pairings and so that that's the one thing that i love about team kind of events is that you can you can do so much more work off the table to win than in a singles event in my opinion right it's just like if there's just and and the the deeper you dig and the more you do just it's like it just gets like opening like you know just like you know it's like doing more lines of coke or something like that you're just going deeper and deeper and deeper not that i know but i'm just you yeah, know it's, we are all good boys here we don't, we don't do we don't do such things at all no that's, that's no but, but it's like the crack adage right like it just keeps getting addicting and addi like that's how i i perceive it and it's just so much fun um and like the one really awesome part about the etc or wtc is like you know as a canadian we're not the most nationalistic country but we are a little bit and i've never really had a chance to kind of express that nationalism or that like canadian pride for the most part like you know um i, I do watch the world cup but i'm an italy fan because my country never qualifies right and, and that's where my 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 rel my you know my grandparents are all from italy so it, but this is the one aspect of, of my life where it's it's actually the aspect where I probably care a lot about. Like, obviously, 40K is a huge part of all of our lives because we're addicted to it and we love it and it's enjoyable and all our friends do it. But this also adds that layer of actually being able to represent your country. And, um, you know, there's not a, there's there's nowhere else that you can do that in this hobby. Yeah, it's, it is interesting to see even... I can... I see what you mentioned with my own teammates as well from Turkey who is like who usually approach nationalistic things with let's say skepticism because of the extremists in in the in those ideologies but they are full on like not with not with ethnic nationalism but they are like civic nationalism essentially oh this is like this is actually a good thing because it it is a good way to be in 40k like you mentioned because it is what it is our most for most of us it's our main hobby it's our main pastime except for work and family but it's still 
you get to do it with your friends and you get to do it with in a unique way where if you play just in, in your case let's say in canada in a in just say even a canadian team tournament you're playing against other canadians you don't get to do that except for wtc that's quite unique oh exactly and it's 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 just amazing right yeah to to represent your country and feel like you know it just adds that extra layer of pride and and as you said like yeah you don't want to take nationalism too far but in in the terms of like sports and hobbies i think it's good fun yeah exactly we are not talking about oh just because we beat you in 4k or now we now we are going to annex you or something you know that, that's ridiculous oh you could pay us taxes if we win so <laughs> well first of all we are Turkey and Canada are at 1 1. So, we'll. I mean, we challenged against you. We challenged you at the for the first night in 2019. And that was sort of overestimating our part, I'll be honest. I was like, yeah, because you, you created a really good squad for 2019. I'm like, I remember that. And it's like, when I saw, when we saw your list, it's like, oh, we are a bit outmatched. So, you've actually prepared quite a bit for. The last event so we've always I, i'm kind of the 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 person I, I like to improve i you know and there's certain aspects where you can always improve and you know it's okay to go up and down in, in terms of things but for the most part I, I like to be consistently trying to get better and yeah we started off with the team as more of a let's take who can go um kind of philosophy and i think a lot of people you know, I don't. I wouldn't say they really underestimated us. They probably didn't think about us at all. And uh, but we ended up like you know just kind of bringing who we could get, what armies people had, and then we've been slowly year by year kind of evolving into picking armies that are best for the format, picking players that can play those armies. And so 2019, I, I agree with you. It, like our squad was was very strong, but we've been even since then been trying to improve and always kind of looking forward. And just kind of making the team better and, and that's one of the huge assets to this kind of format is that you know we can we can do those things and become better and you see the change over time like you know way back our first wtc even though it wasn't 40k we were like at the bottom table last round and then we've been slowly climbing our way uh, to the middle tables and we're hoping to get up to the top tables soon enough so yeah i'm, I'm looking at the record by the way I'm, i have the history of that tournament and Canada has been like improving quite a bit. It's like at least proportionally. I mean, you're in twenty nineteen. You got sixteenth place, but that was the most numerous tournament. So it's still proportionally your best result. I also want to ask you. You just mentioned that we used to pick teams that who could come. I don't know who could come <coughs> there, but what changed then? How how how? Do you form your team differently now and for future? Oh, yeah. So in the past, like, we would be like, okay, who wants to go? Put out the all call, ask all your friends, ask everybody. And you'd get, like, you know, 10 people that were like, hey, I'll go. And then, you know, a couple months later, we'd be down to, like, five of us that were actually willing to put, you know, money on the line and, and go. And we'd have to maybe get mercenaries or, or things like that. I think just through the the fact that we had team tournaments, our scenes been been slightly growing. Now we end up having, like this year for our um, 2022 squad, essentially, we had 26 applicants, oh. and this wasn't just 26 people putting their names in. These were 26 tournament players that want to go, um, and so it was actually one of the. I've had to kind of cut people in the past because maybe they didn't jive or things didn't go well. But this was the first year where we had to actually, you know, trim players from our, like, selection process that, like, if I went to a tournament and played them, it would be, like, a really challenging game, and I would be, like, really worried to beat them. And they didn't make our top 16, we called it. So, yeah, it's been a big change. Um, I think a lot of that was cost uh, and just, just optics of it, right? Uh, there was a lot of people that didn't even know we had a team for many years and we we just worked you know people like scary who has his uh youtube channel he promotes the wtc a lot um i did the best with my can hammer show and stuff like that to kind of promote the wtc and, and put us kind of out there and i think in time it just became more of a thing where people thought hey i can apply i have a decent shot at getting on the team and it's worth worth kind of the investment uh, yeah. so 
Yeah, there's a lot of things that kind of grew, grew to that. But this year was was just mind blowing that that we had so many players. Yeah, it's I agree with the once the WCC idea penetrates the community, it the it increases exponentially the player bases. It's like you you might struggle for the first few years, but it when it takes root, people actually there are a good amount of country communities that um. That sort of, like the Rappers was that schedule their entire year tournaments and all their activities around the WCC event. So mm-hmm. it's like the the August is reserved for the WCC, and then they'll they'll put their big tournaments several months back. They'll look at team qualifier. They'll put the other co- like they'll try to put team tournaments as practice sort of, at and to find out who what armies are good, what players are good. And how, do you have such a plan for Canada? How do you plan to pick your players? And you mentioned twenty six players. That's quite many. Yeah. So we started in. Uh, well, th- this year we started a little bit early because of COVID. Obviously, it was canceled mm-hmm. last year and the year before, sadly. Mm-hmm. Um, and and we made the conscious decision. So when when the first COVID happened, we had a team ready to go, and we 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 essentially kept the same team. And then the second year, we we disbanded the team uh, because. You know, it just wasn't fair to those people that have been playing this edition and, and, and practicing for it. So, yeah, so we started off in about June with an application process. Everybody came in. We did kickoff meetings. We did biweekly meetings. And then we did kind of like on TTS, we assigned players matches. And then we recorded all that data. And so we used about three months with assigning people weekly games, um, bi-weekly games, um, plus any scrimmages against other countries that we wanted to work from. We picked players and played them. And we used that time frame to essentially assess people's dedication, kind of their fit, uh, what armies they play. You know, like if you were a very good Dark Eldar player, but we had 15 of them, you know, the bot, like, you know, and you're the, the bottom guy, it's, you know, you may be better than people playing other armies, but, you know, it wasn't as maybe a good of a fit. And so we used those three months of playing and meetings and kind of talking to people to kind of get down to a top 16. And that's actually where we're at right now is we have 16 uh, fully committed picked players. Um, We call this our actual full-on team. So, and I want to make sure that that's very clear is that the 16 people that we have right now in our group that, you know, we do our scrimmages with, we practice, we still do our meetings regularly. That is the team. Um, now, some of those players won't get to go because eventually we are going to have to pick what we call the A squad. But, um, you, know, you know, we want to make that clear to, so that when we're practicing and we're preparing, these 16 people, they're all the people that are kind of training and they're the future of our team. So even if they don't get to go this year, a lot of them will gain the experience through the practicing and potentially coming along as non-players if they want to that then uh, the year after they might be able to to attend. And so now that we've got it down to 16, our next step is to isolate what factions we want to bring, and then, of course, pick the best players for those factions. Obviously, the, that latter part will, not, will not happen for at least several more months, simply because of the release of new rules. Yeah, and that's the thing that we struggle with the most, is that there's going to be new rules being released right up until May, right? But let's face it, when you live in North America, you need to have your plane tickets by April. So we we need to do a little bit of pre-committing. So that's why we're doing so much early practicing, so many scrimmages against other countries. Like right now, we're playing the Irish and the Polish. Uh, we've played Northern Ireland several times. We played England in a tournament last summer. We played, like, you know, we've been trying to, to just stress test our players and test them. And then, yeah, sometime in the new year, I think probably January, we'll, we'll, we'll go down to, we'll start kind of formulating that A squad with the intention that, you know, we'll guess the meta the best we can. Um, so, but you're right. Like, I don't know what books are coming out. Like after Custodes, Custodes and Gene Stealer cults, I don't actually know if there's any more books anytime soon. Yeah, so. and even those are delayed. So you cannot even assume the books because they might simply be delayed a few months. You did mention TTS though, and that is something I want to know. How has TTS changed on your looking or your ideas of picking a team, practicing to the years beforehand? 
Yeah, so I, I've been talking to a lot of other casuals. Uh, TTS is mandatory for our team. So there's a couple things. One is Discord. You need to have it. Mm -hmm. You need to use it um, to communicate. Um, and the other one is TTS is mandatory. And the reason for that is, like, it, you know, we, I can't just get in my car. Like, so we have uh, one of our teammates in Vancouver, Alex. It's like a whole week to drive to his house. It's like a seven-day drive. Um, you know, yeah, and even my assistant captain, Ridvin, like, he lives in Barry. Like, we live in the same province, but it's it's a good five-and-a-half, six-hour drive if we want to see each other. So we, we can't just, you know, have practice weekends, and we can't just play each other randomly. Um, we've tried that in the past where it's just like, hey, play locally. Go to as many local RTTs as you can and, and focus your skills. And we just found that that was just not – a feasible way for us to assess players now with tts coming out in covid which really made tts a necessity because of the you know just how like isolated everybody had to be there and our, our country locked down very hard for covid um you know it kind of forced us to use it and then we never looked back because now i can just play it play a guy in vancouver we can practice against poland we can practice against you know all these other different countries around the world and it, it's really opened us up to more practice and more meaningful practice. Um, you know, I, I believe there's a big difference between practice and meaningful practice. And so TTS has allowed us to play the best in the world, see their lists, um, get our butts kicked by them, and take away and learn lessons from that experience that we never got before playing locally. You know, it's really easy to dominate a local meta, be the big guy at an RTT and win all your RTTs and be like, hey, look how awesome I am. Let's go to Europe. And then you go to Europe and it's not, not quite the same. So slapped in the face and get sent back home with a with a very with a very sad demeanor yeah i i, I fully agree with you although i don't i don't prefer tts it i see the importance it can have because it's obviously yeah nobody does yeah it's, well first there are many good aspects of it first of all you don't need to buy assemble and paint the miniatures because it's like okay that's that need that creates a very good opportunity to test the list immediately instead of just proxying it because even when you proxy it in a real life it's really not the same you can't properly do line of sights you cannot feel get into the feel of why would a real life game work but how do you do you see a difference i don't know if real life tournament has started in canada yet but i have oh heard, they have yeah uh, i have heard that in, for some countries that players who are good at TTS but haven't played in uh, tabletop 40k before cannot really translate that skill into tabletop 40k easily. I agree with that. Um, you know, we played a lot of big tournaments uh, for TTS and stuff like that, and it has aspects that that it's very good at. Um, so, like, as you said, you proxy, you can, like, put armies on, you can actually see what an army looks like, uh, which is, which is, you know, a lot of veteran players, I think, probably find that there's less transition between TTS and the real life, because of the fact that if you've played, like, 10,000 games of 40k, a lot of what you do is instinctual, uh, with your gut, you know, you're playing a certain way, you're not necessarily thinking through everything analytically, and so that doesn't necessarily translate into TTS 100%, because you've lost kind of like your fifth um you know your fifth your extra site or something like that that you have kind of built into you and you have to kind of relearn that from scratch on, on this this interface and then vice versa so if you're used to tts being able to constantly measure super precise movements and you're using those super precise measurements to really dick people around and and push the envelope that way in real life that just isn't going to work right because you can't be that precise uh, um, there's a sorry you go on please no, and I was going to say, and also one thing I noticed is that, like, we played in some TTS, like, tournaments, and there would be guys, like, who would play four-hour games, and they'd be thinking and reading their rule, and you could tell that they were just, like, they weren't, like, interacting with you. They were just, like, 100% focused on the game, and I don't know what they were doing or who they were talking or whatever. I'm not even saying they were, but they have all this kind of lack of pressure and all this time, whereas in real life, you don't have unlimited amount of time and people are going to bump into you and people are going to talk to you it is going to be loud in the hall and it's a big difference than just playing on tts you know yeah and for 
except for one country, it will be a foreign country. You will probably not be able to talk the native language, considering yeah. it's in Europe. And then you, you'll be coming from a hotel, maybe you might be jet lagged in case of Canada. You there will it will be loud, it will be noisy, smelly. You simply, it, I'm not saying we are not hygienic. That's really not an issue. But when there are two hundred to five hundred people in a single hall, there is an atmosphere of it. It and people will offer you drinks in a friendly way. For example, have you ever played against Romania? Oh yeah. Uh, I think we did once a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they give you that bottle of whatever it is, um, paint thinner, and uh... <laughs> and they demand it be finished before the game starts. So you ha- there's a group of sixteen. You have to finish that bottle, and that's like one and a half shots per person. So it's like, okay. <laughs> so the and so the, that is that's actually the, a difference compared to TTS. Like it, it's always a thing between. A good online players in any platform in esports as well, not maybe translating into actual tournament, local arena tournaments, and I think that should apply to forty k as well. A good, a good amount of teams practicing in TTS, and I'm curious how that will turn out in actual life. I'm, I'm not saying it will be good or bad. I simply don't know, and I'm really, really curious if. Uh, those players who ma- major majority practice time spent on TTS can perform the same way in a different country in a different environment. Yeah, like I think it's 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 uh, you know TTS is a tool and you have to use it as such, and um, it's definitely having TTS is better than not having it. And oh, so yeah. don't so it's really easy for people to get on their horse and you know I've seen all the memes and oh TTS players aren't but. I can tell you this, the guys that play TTS when we were locked down and then when the tournaments opened up, those are the guys that, you know, came out winning and, and they were, and so I think if you're a veteran player, you could use TTS to learn the skills, learn the armies, practice the rules, get the flow of the game, but of course you need that real life practice, uh, you know, and there's other games like that, like in chess and stuff like that, even though chess is a lot simpler in some ways and more complex than others. You know, they play online, but in real life, you have to move the pieces and not knock the pieces and use the clock. And, you know, it's a, it's a lot more challenging. And I think you have to do both, and you have to pick players that do both. Um, just like you need players that play really well in singles and can also transition to teams, right? So those two styles of events are different. And, and same with TTS and just playing in real life. And, yeah, luckily here, we started opening up events um, – smaller events a year ago and we've had quite a few larger events like we had we had a 120 person tournament in toronto Uh, i think that was two months ago we did a 16 five-man team event in sudbury ontario which was that was a few a month ago my team actually won that which was pretty awesome and uh, i i just played in an rtt uh three days ago in uh ottawa so yeah, we've been playing a lot of real life, and then you supplement that with your TTS, and I think you, you're you a better player in the end. Oh, I agree. And one thing uh, that you mentioned that players do to use TTS is good, but also you need, will need to be able to do both. That wants me to ask you, that well, a sort of a statement then, I, I would like your comment on it. You also, That doesn't just apply to TTS. You also need players who, in my opinion are capable to play more than just their armies. They should be able to comment on both their uh, team members' armies and also the opponent's armies as well. You Ideally, you'd want all your players to be, let's say, competent in every aspect of a team tournament, which is quite different compared to a singles tournament. In, in a singles tournament, it's you don't need, because you don't have any allies there, you don't really care about other people's scores. It's only your score that matters. But in team tournament, you can uh, you can manipulate the pairing. And on top of that, let's say you are playing chaos and your Eldar player, you need to be you need to go and teach your Eldar player as a chaos player how to de- how to defeat yourself. Yeah, to a certain extent, I don't think you need. Now, obviously, we've never won. 
So <laughs> take take what I say with the grain. Like this is just lessons that I've been learning, and I will continue to learn. And you know, you in two years, what I say now may be BS, and I think that's that's what you have to do as a captain is you have to grow and you have to change and you have to look at things. Um, I, I think like from what your point is is as a captain, you need to pick the players and know what they're good at and know what they're bad at. And so you could have a player that plays one army and they're the best in the country at it. And that's okay. You just can't have eight of those people on your team. Um, You know, there are going to be those guys that aren't as, I guess, well-rounded and aren't as maybe critical of other people's lists. You just don't want to have your whole team as them. You want to have a good mix or minimize those players. And so as a captain, I like to know what I'm getting out of a player you know, when you look at, like, a, a professional football club, you know, there's superstars that are just assholes in the locker room that nobody likes, but they score goals and they win. And I think on a WTC team, you have to have the same attitude. There could be a guy that people maybe rubs the wrong way or that doesn't really add any extra value to the team except for their game and how they play and win. And that's okay as long as you know that that's what their role on the team to do is, and that's what you expect from them, is to play their match and get, and get all the points. Um, and then you might have weaker players that play, you know, lower tier armies. Um, or maybe they're really strong players, but they play lower tier armies, so they don't do as well. And you need those people. And then you need the players that can jump around and and also um, learn other armies and switch last minute to a new army and still be proficient with it. And I think a, a good captain knows all their personalities and learns the personalities of their team and then ass- and just kind of expects that from them. Um, now, of course, everybody expects mentorship and practice. So, yeah, if you're the chaos player, yeah, you train your teammates how to beat you instead of, like, always gotching them and, you know, no, that's a secret. I'm not going to help you beat me because if we meet at a singles tournament, I don't want to lose to you. No, you do need players that want to be together, want to win, and want the team to win first over themselves. And same with matchups, right? You want people that want the team to win. And so they put their matchups in to help the team win, not necessarily give them the most battle points and be the most successful player. And so that's kind of like what I think about like the team is 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 more along those lines. And so I, I can't say there's one type of player that's like you want eight of this guy, um, but you definitely need some leaders, you need some followers, and you need some killers, and you need some like softer people, right? That are, um, that are you know more team oriented. Yeah, you are actually that's a more I think I agree with you as well. So it might be a more nuance, and I think that's a better way to say it. Because one thing that uh, that is usually forgotten, not not by the captains, the captains in a way, but more of outsiders and just the regular players, is that just because you scored low in the WTC format doesn't mean you are a bad player. It usually means you you are one of there's a good chance that your best player in the team will score the lowest. That there's a very good chance of it, simply because you send out that guy as the first defender every time, and he will just have to play against the two worst lists in the opponent team. And that is, you, you also need somebody psychologically who can do that six to nine games in a, in a weekend. As a, Oh, that's hard to find. Um, yeah, we call it check your ego at the door. To find a guy that can go in and just take the, you know, right, the Dark Eldar, you know, nine rounds in a row and just get as many points out of it as they can and still stay positive, that is a challenge. And, and there are some people that are incapable of that. And, you know, that's something that I look at. Is I have a couple guys that I've brought in the past and I know now that you have to give them an army that they can win with and you have to try and put them in the attacker role or the winning role. Because if you don't, it's it's not necessarily best for them, which isn't best for the team. And so that's that's another part of like using using the the players to a certain um, in a certain way, right? Depending on their personalities, uh, which is cool. Uh, the one thing that I really um, like about I guess WTC, just to, it's a little bit of a tangent, is like is it rewards the players in your community who don't meta chase as hard. Like they meta chase with their army but they don't meta chase like book jumping, right? And so there are players that will take a lower tier book because it's good for the WTC and they'll play that book all year and people will say, oh, that guy's not as good as this guy. How come this guy made the team over him? And it's like, well, he's played a harder book 
and he stayed committed to the cause for the whole year, right? Like, it's easy to jump to Admech, Dark Eldar, um, and all the good books and win events, right? Like, I've done it in the past, done six armies in a year, won a ton of events, um, but then you switch to a, a B tier or a C tier list and you just play it because it's good for the team for the whole year. It appears as if you're doing worse than a lot of your community, especially with these ranking systems. And so you got to be very careful with that as a team environment, right? You can't just pick the top 20 ranked players because they may just be all switching books, playing the, the most broken books, which is, which is fine to do too. I'm not dissing that. I've done it. I love it. I wish I could do it. But, you know, to me, my priority is the WTC and winning that. So that means that I play, I play sisters right now. They're really good at times and they're really mediocre at times. And, but we need that kind of element. So we practice that. And I'd say, yeah, my personal results suffer, but they're for the team, right? Oh, I totally agree. It is like a experienced captains and players will know this only only by their experience with WTC. So you might have been playing for say for a decade or so, and you might come to this uh, event thinking, as in, let's say you became a fresh captain of your country, and you say, oh, I'll create a meritoc just a purely meritocratic system where only the highest scoring tournament players will form a team you will fail you'll not be able to form a proper team simply because it is not possible at the moment at the current state of 40k and i don't think that will change anytime soon to find eight players in with eight different factions that will be able to form a team you you have to con you have to consider all the things we have mentioned so far uh, to be able to play with one army for a long period of time, to be able to psychologically handle it, to be financially able to handle it, which is, I'm not sure how it is with the Canada team, for the, for the team, for the system players you mentioned, but that's usually the main factor for a lot of teams, which is, can you financially make this trip? And yeah, or, or will you, are you willing to change some aspect of yourself to play on the team like for example there's players that will not borrow an army they only play i only play with the army that i paint myself and therefore i'm not willing to change so when a last minute book comes out and you're like hey we want you to bring this gross list the guy goes i i i don't have enough time to build and paint it and it's like that's, well that doesn't line up with us right like that's a just borrow it you cannot have for wtc and uh, because you have been there in 2018 Salamanca. That's the start of 8th edition. We immediately switched to 8th edition. And that we had armies with... Turkey had an army with 450 guard from model. Yeah. That's not... Go you're nobody in the... Well, maybe except for one or two very dedicated people will have 450 guard from models. You'll have to borrow them. And you shouldn't. And like, so we had the same thing. We've had that in the past. And so everything that I'm saying is all lessons that we've learned in the past and no shame or anything, but we, you know, we're moving forward. We like to learn from it. But yeah, we've had the same thing where instead of practicing with your army, you're spending all night building and painting it and it's hurting the team, right? Because now your performance is lower because of these like arbitrary rules on yourself. And I'm just picking on that one. There, there's plenty of other ones, right? Like, you know, um, but it, it's, it's, kind of the thing you got to do is you have to be a team player you have to be willing to be flexible and bend and um yeah so if you just pick the top five player eight players from your country in the rankings you'll be like you know you might well in seventh ed anyway you'd end up with eight eldar players <laughs> then you can't build a team with that right so i think in seventh ed what was it like five or six death stars and two armies that that had storm that could kill those death stars and that was it that, yeah, because um, it was very specific because WTC still allowed a visibility where we didn't here, so we had oh, a lot more MSU. But yeah, they nerfed it over here. Um, but no, it, yeah, it's cool. And then there's like one year where uh, I forget what year it was, but it was every Space Marine book had like as many Storm Ravens as they could fit in. And it's like, so, so your team needed to have like 25 Storm Ravens or something crazy like that. That was and, 2017. Uh, I'm, I, a few minutes ago, I mistakenly said the 2018 event was Salamanca, it was 2017, and we had more Storm Ravens in the tournament than players. In that, I think we had 220 something Storm Ravens to 210 players, and this is just with one or two Space Marines per team. So it's like everybody 
at 405 Space Marines in each Space Marine capable army. But okay, that that you that is essentially a sick list. And I was like, wow, and you cannot expect anybody to build and paint that by themselves because it's simply a lot of money and a lot of time like you mentioned you need to you need those hobby times to go into skill playing skill yeah and it wasn't like you had a lot of like people might say oh well you know it's five models how long yeah but i the edition dropped and we were playing several months later so you're not talking a large time frame in between um you know for these books, right? And, and I kind of feel bad if a really good book drops in, in May, you know, you may have to pump out an army really quick. And so, yeah, it is good to have players that can switch armies last minute and to build and paint quickly or to, that are willing to borrow. And yeah, it's really cool that that, and, and the thing about that uh, WTC and kind of armies that that's, I guess, cool is that because you're not allowed to duplicate books, it ends up making a lot of those armies that aren't necessarily really good in singles really good in the team format. And that's that's kind of the thing that I love the most about it is that you see more variety. And I can go a whole weekend. Well, now they've been nerfed. I wouldn't say into the ground, but, you know, before you're going to a singles event a couple weeks ago and you're playing like two two Admech players, three Admech players, or two Dark Eldar, two Admech. Whereas now, like you go to the WTC, I can go a whole weekend and never play. Yeah. against admech if it counters my list right like so especially if you are uh, not one of the first defenders or first attackers because those are usually the the pairing process the first few pairings are where teams try to switch evenly and try to win over at the later pairing if you are one of those b tier c tier armies you mentioned maybe sisters in this case you'll probably not play the same army twice in in seven eight doesn't matter how many rounds you probably because after the pre fall initial picks which are obvious to pick at any given state of 40k you need four more armies for your team and that is that's where people decide on different things which is which is the good part which is okay so poland thinks that let's say gray knights are good compared to uh Italy, who thinks Asa Militarum can do better for a fifth army, which is, um, which is where national differences actually show themselves. Yeah, that's how you win the games too. Like this is my opinion, obviously, and you know we did the disclaimer earlier. I haven't won yet, but hoping too soon. Um, is yeah, like it's really easy to build. It's really easy to look at an eight-man team and look at like the top five books and build like the top five lists. And then I feel like the rounds are one, and like everybody's going to do that, right? So we did this team tournament in Sudbury uh, two weeks ago, and like ev almost every army had an Admech player, and almost every army had like an Orc player, a Grey Knight player, a lot of them had Dark Eldar players, or vice versa. Most most armies, most five man teams had three out of those four books. Whereas, and then I think where the events and the rounds are won and lost is on your last book choice or. In the WTC case, it would be the last, you know, you're going to take those five really good books, and then the last three is how you're going to win. And I think that's going to be the difference between the really good teams and the mid-level teams is how they play those last three factions and what they take and who's playing them, right, um, is it, going to be a big deal. And that, that's kind of, that's where I like to, to put a lot of my effort into is those last three kind of skewed lists or, or something different, which is cool. Yeah, those the last latter half of the pairing process is ex exactly how you said it's it's a, you can it's the it's the place where you can pull some tricks you can try to deceive obviously not with any actual like malice just you know deceiving the oh deceive your opponents when they think you'll put out x defender and you put out y defender which will throw their entire pairing process off uh, which which is which is uh, the most exciting part. The, the initial part of the pairing process is usually a ceremony where, okay, let's try to play evenly and we'll see what happens. You did mention a few times as a disclaimer that you haven't won yet, which is one of the questions I want to ask. If WTC happened today, where do you think you will play as Team Canada? Which, let's say you get your A team, like your ideal A team from the proper 16 person team. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, this is where, you know, do you be humble with a question like this or do you go full on cocky? 
Um, that's something that I struggle with as well. Our goal is to podium and or win. Um, now that goal is a, has been ongoing for a couple of years now mm -hmm. and will continue to go whether or not we podium or win this year. I think we will do, you know, I feel like we were comfortable in years past in the middle of the pack. So there was definitely half the teams that we were very comfortable playing against and doing quite well against. And uh, there's a bunch of teams that we're really worried about. That being said, though, um, we have arguably the best team we've ever had. Um, you know, in years past, we always had one or two players that were um, a little bit beyond what they were capable of. They were fairly new, and they were having, they were really, really struggling. Lots of zeros, and I don't think we had that this year. So I would say for sure, if I was a betting man, we'd be in the top 25% for sure. Um, but we would really love to podium, and we're working very hard to do so. Yeah, and I just as a disclaimer to listeners, WCC doesn't have any prize money or anything. This is just about uh, bidding the thing for its own sake. There's, there is a trophy, obviously, and we'll, we are going to have a, a traveling trophy as well. Uh, we are working on it as we are. And it's just, it's just a bragging right. It's <laughs> yeah, that's. That's a, it is bragging rights. One thing though that I don't I don't know what you're doing this year, but one thing that I always thought about is like really not because like we've won awards there, uh, mainly painting and sportsmanship. We've won I don't know how many, but I think I've won uh, three painting and two sportsmanships since uh, 2015. Um, and like I don't know, I think I think it'd be nice to have really nice plaques for the winning team or the top three teams. Like nothing super like plaques aren't super expensive, but I think that would be something really cool. But as you said, yeah, there, it's not for prize money. And, and I don't personally, I don't care about prize money or product. It's it's you're there to be the best country in the world. Yeah, yeah. the product is like there's no way we are getting enough to vote when it comes to product. Anyway, we have to eat all our luggages have to fill with just models in order to make up for the cost we make, we plan to come to the event. So it's not like it yeah. will happen. Or if you get a medal, I think last year you guys did, or two years ago you guys did medals. Like to have one of those medals that said like you were first or second or third in the world yeah. in terms of team events. Like that, that to me is an item that I would cherish, you know. I don't know, for, I wouldn't say for the rest, maybe for the rest of my life, but it's, it's definitely something you cherish. You know, there's a couple medals that I have on my shelf. You know, because obviously if you're going to the WTC, you probably have a lot of trophies and you've won a lot of product, but you know... It's 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 more like something to remind you of the memories, just something special, which is kind of nice. So, I still actually have right now sitting right next to me, is is we have our uh, 2019 favorite opponent banner is hanging like literally two feet away from me, and that is one um, of the pictures that's uh, rotating in the background. So if anybody's listening, they can one of the pictures is you as a team holding that as well and, and that was a big deal for us because so i i uh i posted on facebook that that's the award that we won the favorite country to play against and i got a lot of really really meaningful um comments and posts from that photo because i think a lot of and this is where we get into the nationalism a little bit a lot of the canadian identity is that we like to think of ourselves as the nice guys <laughs> even though it's probably not true but uh yeah it's, but it was it is a sort of a running meme that you are all about uh being nice yeah about being nice <laughs> the guy i got what you can put out there but um you know and i got a lot of uh there's a couple i work with a couple ex-military people and one of them sent me a message he said you know to go and compete and, and we did well last year like we were upper middle of the pack i think um or in the middle i think we're dead in the middle of the pack actually now that i think about it no, you are. and but to come back and have have people that don't even know what 40k is have no clue what we're doing and be like, I'm proud that you guys went there and were voted the favorite country to play against. You know, that means a lot. And that, that felt really good. So Well, I'll first correct the record. You were not in the middle because Turkey was in the middle. You were better than the middle. You got 16th place out of 36. So that's upper half. So I'll sort of uh, fluff your feathers a bit. Oh, thank you. My ego, my ego just keeps getting bigger, and I, I appreciate it. Yeah, <laughs> and we, that is true. It's like good. It is actually so. What well, this is the picture actually that's in the background now. 
it but not a landscape uh, it is it is actually something to be proud of well i mean everything that you that is currently awarded in the system is already the, the first second third place and the best painted obviously but there are some things that you can not buy or you cannot simply grind your way and that is like most friendly opponent and a few other things are you need to actually be that there's no faking it there's no uh, there's no way that you can cheat your like cheat not in not in a malicious way just there's no easy shortcut for it you need to actually be a, the, the the most friendly team against all of your opponents yeah, and I guess 2019 was a big one because I think we've won that three times, and and uh, it's easy to win it when you're losing. It, I'm not gonna say easy, but it's when you're going there for a laugh. It's easy to be a nice guy. In 2019, believe it or not, we were playing to win. Oh, uh, we may have not we 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 got the top half, but we were going there, trying our darndest to do as best as we could. Um, you know, and that's so that made that year even sweeter for us. Okay, well. Our time is sort of running short, so I'll do. I'll ask you one final question because we we it is all. It has been almost an hour. I had sort of gone past really. I thought it was about. We were about thirty minutes mark, but when I checked it, oh, it has been fifty five minutes already. So yeah, uh, and I know you are busy, so I don't want to take your much of your time. And so I'll ask my final question. Before that, can you tell us how people can find about Team Canada if they? I mean, everything will be linked, what you said, but can you, if somebody wants to contact Team Canada or w try to join Team Canada, how can they do that? Yeah, so we have a Facebook page, um, facebook.com, uh, go to facebook.com and uh, just search for, like, Team Canada World Team. You'll see our photo uh, with some, you know, I think it's got the photo that you were talking about with our uh, sportsmanship uh, trophies and that, and... Uh, you just go on there and you message us. Um, there's a couple key times. Like, so if you were to contact me right now about joining the team, it's not the best time because we are through initial selection and we are working on final selection for this summer in, in uh, I guess, 2022. Um, but usually we start ramping up around the end of August for the next year. So the best time, if you want to play on the team, is make it known as early as possible to any member of the team or that Facebook page. Um, we will start keeping an eye on you, for lack of a better term, you know. Um, we, we, we need to, obviously, it's a very competitive spot now. I never thought I'd say that, but it's a very competitive spot to get on the team now. And um, so, yeah, we'll start watching you, but we really only start applications in September. So, yeah, you can find us there. Um, a couple of the key people is, like, I guess if you're um, – our team, we have a very – well – strict kind of selection process so we only select citizens residents and people that live here um so and if if you're one of those groups and you play competitive 40k you probably run into either myself or ridvin at any tournament so you know just come say hi and the, it is a nice problem to have as a, having your nations national team but as a competitive spot i guess it's it's a good problem to have Okay. It, it is. It's also very stressful on the captain because um, it makes Cry it very, you know what I mean? It's easy to pick a team when you have eight applicants, but when you have 26 applicants, it really, you know, it's it's one of those things. I actually have a lot of empathy for professional, like, sports coaches and things like that that have to make those decisions, you know, that are on a bigger scale than what we have to do. But, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, hoo, hoo, cry me out of it. <laughs> I will all day. <laughs> that's like a that's a, most of the European countries would would be are envious of being in such a situation and was like the, they had the problem of oh, can we even form a certain team so yeah boo hoo okay <laughs> jokes aside and my little violin right I'll play that little violin all day little, little tiny uh, so this is sort of a quality control thing and it's more like taking your idea as well. But as a final question, can you describe your ideal WTC event? Like what it would be? Uh, or whatever comes to mind. Whatever comes to what the question is open ended. You can answer however you like. Um, it would be in a giant hall 
with the air conditioning set to somewhere around 17 degrees Celsius. <laughs> wow. But, oh. There would be... <laughs> okay. Well, it is. Uh, so that's one thing about North America to Europe on a tangent there is that you you guys, what you consider air conditioning is not what we consider air conditioning, by the way. Um, <laughs> okay. Okay. But anyway, so yeah, I, I, would I would love to see, the, uh, my ideal WTC would be, um, you know, obviously we're not going to get 250 countries because that's going to be challenging, but I would love to see somewhere in the neck of 50, 60 countries fully represented and when I close my hall, I should I I'd like to be able to look around and and know from just looks what the countries are. You know, nice. Yeah, you know, everybody has nice jerseys in their country flag, and you know, just lots of representation. Every team you play at would be full from their country. Not that that's a bad thing if they're not, because I understand people can't. But like my ideal WTC would be like just a true representation of the world that when you go there you get to see and play people from all over the world that represent their country and th and th to me that's the most important part um but if i go into the past i think the best one was the one you guys did in 2019 like serbia was awesome and uh it which is weird because i actually was not super stoked to go to serbia because i didn't know anything about it but it turned out really really yeah, well so we thought was a great town to have the event in it's like it's not perfectly sized it wasn't too big it wasn't too small you could the eateries and the bars were all close together so when you went to a place you would most likely encounter some other uh, other 40k player or maybe some other 98 or french football players it was great and okay so do, to wrap up so you essentially want to have a proper world event yeah something that's like rivals the olympics would be like my my ideal event would be yeah, just just pristine, beautiful tables, mass representation, and just something that was like you know the real deal. And I'm not saying that this isn't it is this is the best we got. It's the best, but you know what I mean. Like it would be to to have that kind of world representation would be like just fantastic, oh, and agree. it would show that our hobby is growing and that our hobby is everywhere in the world. Because let's face it, you know some countries are richer than others, but this is still a rich country hobby for the most part and it would be nice to see more inclusion there you know yeah, obviously the game social release some let's say more affordable minis that might help but 3d printing <laughs> seems to help with that anyway <laughs> yeah uh, okay and i by the way i took the note keep the canadians hot so they will pull that one poorly against you I don't, is that well it's thing? always hot for us man I, I i remember check oh my god i think i had heat stroke that weekend so. I, I think a few people actually did so I, I wasn't involved in that, so I'm like, I'm, I'm keeping my hands clean. I only became a chairman in 2017, so yeah, that's not my problem. <laughs> yeah, who, who knew the Canadians like it cold? I, I don't know where, where that came from, but <laughs> okay. we don't call it the Great White North for nothing, right? <laughs> so before we wrap things up, do you have any shout outs you want to give out? Uh, well, I just want to thank, uh, you know, you, Tom, and Neil for all the hard work that you guys put in, especially through COVID. You know, like, you guys essentially organized the event twice, and it never materialized, and I, I know that must have been frustrating. Uh, so thank you for all your work, and, you know, all, especially because when we broke away from the ETC to form the WTC, you know, you guys haven't actually been able to realize the event. You haven't been able to do it because of this, you know, stupid time that we live in. Uh, so thank you so much. So I get, like it's it's been a pleasure working with you guys the last three years, and uh, I'm looking forward to this summer. Other than that, though, I'd like to just shout out my whole team. I won't name them because there's 16 of them, but and all those people that didn't that applied and didn't make the team, you know, thank you so much um, for for you know applying and making this a great year, and hopefully we podium. And if not, we'll try again the year after. And now that's it. That's a that's a great end to this podcast. So. Uh, thanks to everybody for listening and hope you listen to the future episodes. Bye. <laughs>